Welcome to the Sound and Marketing Podcast. Today we conclude our conversation with Simon Fowlerfield of Equal Strategy about the importance of brand experience through the utilization of the senses. Feelings matter. That's very true. I mean, if you uh, if you have a favorable experience and you talk about it, that's huge brand equity right there. That's huge. Word of mouth is, I think, bigger than any kind of marketing campaign that people can pay attention to. If you're hearing it from your best friend, hey, you got to check this out, that will be more credible than some, you know, agency that's writing a really cool commercial. Um, and we always talk about customer service and our experience and how we were treated. It just makes sense that you would tap into this emotional lever- level, this sensory marketing, as we've only briefly used the word in this conversation, but to to have a sensorial perspective through our marketing makes sense because at, as we are emotional and we are sensorial creatures, we will respond better to our ourselves, our peers, our friends than a nameless, faceless company. And a lot of my research has been going into the consumers of now, and I think it was something like 54% of the consumers, at least in the US, now are millennials. And millennials shop different than Gen X and baby boomers and all the other titles that you put on people. Um, they, They want to have a connection. They want to believe in the company that they are, that they're um, uh, patroning at. They, they want to make sure that they have a good mission. And these are all very emotionally driven responses that they have. So uh, it makes sense that branding and mark, sensory marketing should be a line item on your budget. It's, it's, you know, it, it comes down to authenticity that a brand has to be what it says it is. And it isn't just about the product. It's about everything that touches and and reflects that brand. And this is really sort of where where we started 23 years ago, that just to sort of wind the clock back, all the companies were, if you picked up nice glossy magazines, read the newspaper, brands were creating these very nice, funky advertisements that were enticing you to respond to that advert, which at the bottom of the advert, the call to action was dial this number to make a reservation. And what would happen is that you'd respond to this advert, but the experience you had when you phoned up really wasn't on par with the advert that prompted you to make that call. What we found was that we were talking to a lot of banks, hotels, they were creating these nice snazzy adverts that were great pieces of marketing. But when you saw this picture of this nice resort, exotic resort, or luxurious hotel, but then when you phone them up, you're subjected to listening to Kenny G music playing. It breaks the fan. Playing on a loop (laughs) or horrible ding dong, ding dong music. It makes, you know, that becomes that moment of truth because hoteliers talk about the moment of truth. But when you see that the telephone experience wasn't congruent with the advert and the tone and the feel, of the imagery and then what you're subjected to when you found up, you immediately realize that, oh, this hotel has got a great advert, but what I'm experiencing here on the telephone is going to be what I'm going to experience at the property. So immediately your expectation drops and your emotions and your feelings as to falling in love with that brand or that vision that you were sold starts to diminish. So we we had one great project in Singapore. It was Singapore's first luxury boutique hotel, and it's called the, the Nomi Hotel. And I met the owner when he was building the property. So it hadn't launched. And he got in contact and he shared some of the vision of what this property was going to represent. So it was a very lifestyle, funky, cool boutique hotel. And, and it's quite central in Singapore. It's across the road from the Raffles Hotel, which is one of the, the most beautiful colonial buildings or hotels in, in Singapore. So what I did for this, for this particular property is I engineered this experience that from 
when you look at it from a customer journey, before you stay in a hotel, there's a series of different steps in the process in order for you to arrive at that hotel. So often what will happen, there'll be an advertisement that someone may have seen in a magazine and on the magazine, it will mention the, the website. So people will go magazine to the website. The website is going to be presenting the, the imagery of showing this as a beautiful property. And then from the website, people will probably send an email. Then in that process, before they arrive at the, the property, there may be a series of phone calls that people may be making some calls just to double check on details before they then travel to the property. So I took the this uh, lifestyle boutique concept from, from the property and the music we used in, in the lobby and the swimming pool and the guest hall corridors. And what we did was we applied it across the telephone and also on the website. So when you first went to the website, saw these beautiful pictures and had some light music playing on the website. So the music and the imagery creates this first impression and you go, wow, it becomes a vision that you go, wow, look at this, looks good looks exciting, um, sounds exciting, sounds lifestyle. I, I personally connect with that, with that vision that I'm being sold. And then people will send an email, have some dialogue with the hotel, and it may result in a phone call. And then when you called the hotel, you then heard that same style of music in the greetings that would greet you when you were placed on hold. The same style of music and so what what actually have, starts to happen is that once you start to have that consistent experience across multiple touch points in the customer journey it starts to make the concept that you first saw as even more believable so it consolidates the vision that you've been sold and it actually has a compounded effect and so by the time you then arrive at the property and as the taxi pulls up outside and you can hear that same style music on the speakers outside by the taxi drop off. And it's the same style music that you heard on the telephone, you heard on the website. That, that's an experience then which people don't experience anywhere else. So that in itself differentiates the brand, but on an emotional level, you get more and more drawn into it where you're even more connected with that brand. And so this, this property won all these, all sorts of awards for being the, the best Singapore boutique luxury hotel for, for a number of years. So it's been quite in, exciting and interesting to see what can be achieved. And even, even today, how these details are being adopted by other brands and how we've seen a change in hospitality where a lot there's a new breed of general managers coming through who are very focused and they're almost like accountants where they are managing profit and loss and the revenue more importantly than they are the detailing of the guest experience and working with guests so it's just very interesting and can be quite frustrating at times where we can see people have done amazing projects and implementations that have worked really well and and set the standards but as we see industries evolving, and this is part of the challenge today of the world is it's changing at such a rapid, rapid rate that, and in so many different directions that it becomes quite difficult for businesses to really know what's really important to them because all the goalposts keep moving. The whole emotionally driven experience, um, you know, if it, these examples that you were giving where they had a bad experience and and as a professional, you're going, oh, this is what I'm experiencing. I don't like this. I'm going to move on. But to the average consumer, they don't think about that. They go, I don't like this. Doesn't matter why I'm, go I'm going. So say, say you go, oh, this is the problem. You fix that experience. You fix that song. You fix that um, uh, scent or whatever it is. You've already lost that person. That person's gone. They're not going to come back. Well, I'll give you another try since you fixed this. Because they don't know, like, for the most part, I don't think that they know why they don't like it. They just don't like it. And that's all that matters. That's the bottom line of it. If people don't like it, they don't like it. They don't need a reason or they don't need to justify why. And it's for, and it's for businesses to be ahead of the game and actually be looking at themselves and saying, right, what are we doing well? What are we not doing well? How do we 
compare to the competitors in the marketplace? How does that all fit within the brand matrix of where we really want to be? And how about trying to fix these things? And it's, it's quite scary today to see people who just really don't want to fix anything. And obviously they've got different priorities. And from the other side of the table, we don't get to see that and understand that. But it's, um, yeah, it's, it's been very interesting over, over the last 12 months of all these changes that are taking place. But with the market in a way trying to preserve itself and create massive brand erosion and, and devaluing themselves, there's also opportunity for the brands who want to seize this opportunity and make, make an experience that just redefines the industry. And we have a couple of projects we're working on at the moment, people opening some new businesses and they're just coming in as, as, a, as a total game changer. This is in food and beverage, retail, where they've looked at, it, looked at the industry here for this particular sector. And they just said, right, let, let's just let's just do everything well. Let, let's look at all the things that, that we don't like about how these things are being presented or offered in the marketplace. And how could how could we make that better? And with just having that perspective means that you can do something differently. And if you do it well, you differentiate your brand and you create that competitive advantage. And people are now going to be so much drawn through what takes place on social media about, oh, everyone said this place is good. Boom. That's going to have such a, such a draw. And it's not as if this brand is throwing money at the project. They're not. They're looking at it from a, from a, a perspective of we want to be different. And yes, we're going to do things which are different. And yes, there's costs involved in that. But they're not taking the what I used to joke about is the Microsoft model, which was just throw money at it and, and that marketing would cause or create global domination. But they're, they're looking at it from an aspect of just the mindset of, OK, we want to be we want to be different. We want to do a great job. And how can we do it and how can we achieve our goals without going crazy and going over the top? So even from a music perspective, we're going in with an approach which is about not trying to go crazy. It's middle of the road. Um, don't have to be su too super detailed. We don't need to have any music that doesn't repeat for 10 weeks. They, they, they're trying to keep it on a, on a more sensible model. And where we're looking to use scent, we're just trying to use that strategically to sort of evoke certain experience and things and moves in certain areas. And there isn't anyone else doing anything like this in Singapore. So next time we get to speak, I'll have a, a bit more to talk about that project. But it's mm -hmm. it's a mindset, it's a perspective, and it's, it's a vision of trying to be different and not being in the gravy train business where they're just trying to get business but really don't deserve to have the business. I could talk about this forever. I think you could too. Um, but I think a great way to, to end this conversation would be what's happening now we're heading back into the workplace we're heading back around people we're damaged in the brain right now i don't care what you say everybody's got some issues that they're gonna have to work out in one way or another we're very emotional people and now is the time to harness positive emotions and senses to give ourselves um the feeling of comfort when we're going into like personally if I went into an office right now, I, my stress level would go up. When there's a big crowd, my stress level goes up. Like how can we use sensory marketing to draw people back to our places of work, to our companies, to our businesses and our companies and our products? The role of the office or the workplace before, the, let's think of the world as we knew it then, you know, this is like pre-COVID. Mm. Businesses very much had a view that, yes, this is our office, this is where you work. And certain brands like Google, they they created the Google office where it's a hip, cool, funky, fun place to be working. And you know, you've got great food in the restaurant. And so they've really focused there on creating a workplace that people wanted to work in. And brands like Virgin, they've had such a focus for a number of years over the last what, 10, 15, 20 years 
on creating a workplace that people want to work in. And that's had a very slow effect on trickling out across the market or the world. What we're seeing now is people going, I'm quite happy working at home. I don't want to spend an hour or two hours traveling to work and an hour or two hours traveling home. Why can't I work from home? And generally we're now, because our homes were very emotionally connected with and we can be ourselves in our homes. Businesses now face the challenge of trying to make their staff want to go back to the office. The want is driven by appeal that the office needs to attract people to want to go back. So we've been talking with various different sort of global brands over the last year. And these conversations really started a year ago where they were saying, no one wants to go back to the office. And we have this internal strategy where we want to make the offices more appealing. We're, we're humans, we have five senses. Yes, it needs to look nice. Yes, we need to have some nice furnishing and the design and the visual design of the space. Yes, that has a, an effect on looking cool or nice or looking luxurious and looking as a nice place. But the, the, really the sensorial part of adding sound within spaces has quite a significant role in positive impact because walking into an office lobby or reception and there being nice music playing in the background creates a more homely, connected, warmer feeling between you and that functional place called an office. So that starts as a way to lure people. So if you take a lot of concepts from hospitality and you apply it in, in an office environment, there's a lot you can do with it. And as long as you do things in the appropriate way. So music can have a role of, in the, let's say in the non-working area, music can have a role of creating an atmosphere that is appealing to people, that makes it feel alive. Because we all know that when you walk into a library and it's deadly silent, it isn't a very motivating space. You don't feel connected with it because it's clinically silent. So if you want to have an office that then attracts people, you need to be engaging the senses. And so by having music in the, in the reception area that gives, the, gives a bit of a vibe to the space, if you have it in the pantry and the lounge areas, then again, these are areas that people can relax, they feel more connected. They're going to be, they're going to drop their guard. They're going to want to spend time talking with people. And it starts to, to create a place that feels more homely that they want to be in. In the larger areas where people are working, sounds too can have a role where, and having the right type of sound in an in a open plan office space, it can have a role in actually enhancing performance and productivity. If you play the wrong type of sound in the space, it will be counterproductive. And also by applying scents within a space that when you walk in, it's like when you walk into a lobby and you have a nice, beautiful scent, you walk in there and immediately like, wow, that smells beautiful, that's amazing. You feel connected with that space. If they put an awful scent in there, then that's gonna have a counterproductive effect. Things need to be thought about, but if you do it well, it creates a space to be more enticing and more engaging. And sense too in the working office area can be productive as well. So for example, if you're going to diffuse a sense that has a high arousal perspective to it or a higher high arousal category. So things like vanilla, lavender have a calming and soothing effect on people subconsciously. Whereas if you're exposed to citrus or peppermint, then you will become energized and invigorated and you'll have a, a higher rate of performance. And what they found in some of the scientific behavioral research is that when you diffuse peppermint within an office space, people actually become more focused and more productive. Different tactics can be applied in different areas within a business and you can create a, a, an experience at the end of the day that your staff will enjoy being in, enjoy working in. And overall, this will have a, have a significant impact on making people want to work in the office, 
They're going to love working in that office. This will also have an impact on staff retention because if you enjoy working in your office, you're actually going to be less likely to leave. And the cost of recruiting new people, new staff, isn't even part of the conversations taking place today. So I think the real impact of what we've seen taking place over the last year, we haven't really seen it. And I think in two, three years time, or in five years time, people will be able to look back and go, right, yes, we had one, one year of this COVID, global coronavirus, COVID-19 pandemic, but the consequences of that and what actually the causes of those consequences are and their actions, I think that's going to be quite interesting to see how that all starts to map out. So 10, 20 years time, this will all be taught in the universities, will be part of the syllabus then as to what to do in a crisis and how you should be protecting and preserving your brand because the consequences are going to be significantly higher than you think they really are at that time. You're absolutely right. I think that we haven't seen the results yet. It's far too soon. Um, and <clears throat> some of the things that you were listing, uh, you know, like to, to, to sum up what we're talking about with sensory marking, because we did a lot of talk about sound and a little bit about scent. Um, but I think that the main takeaway in my perspective, why it's sensory marketing and not just the sounds or just the sense or just the taste or touch or look um, is that we're we're all different people so like for example google's head office there's probably a lot of people that don't like the funky and that might not be something that they like about it but maybe they like the music that they play um or maybe they don't like the music but they like the scent um there's there's more opportunities uh when you have a multi-sensorial perspective to create that experience that that positive energy um but i was at the dentist the other day and i was just thinking about the sound of the drill like i just i hate the dentist because as soon as i hear that it's like nails on a chalkboard for me and i was saying it to the hygienist i said oh man if you guys could figure out how to make that quiet i probably would have been much better at the dentist when i was little and she said that just as many people complain about the smell at the dentist as the sound. And that surprised me because the smell hasn't bothered me. But then when you were talking about scent in the office, I don't like scents. Like I wouldn't want peppermint or lavender or anything like that. If it's too much, it's too much for me, but I'm not a scent person. I, I like things unscented, but if, if the rest of the experience was good, I might be able to overlook that and pay attention to the sides that I enjoy. Well, the use of scent doesn't mean you have to create a gas chamber. <laughs> and what they found is that there was an experiment carried out by Nike. And what they did was they took two identical pairs of trainers and they put them in two evaluation rooms. One of the rooms was scented and it was scented to a point where you couldn't detect the scent, but it was there. So it was below what we call conscious level. So below conscious level doesn't mean there's no scent there. It means you can't detect it. And then the other room had no scent. You could walk into both rooms and you wouldn't detect the scent, but one room had been scented and one room wasn't. They sent consumer groups into each of the rooms and when they came out, they said, okay, uh, out of the, the two sets of trainers, which ones do you prefer? People preferred the trainers from the scented room and were prepared to pay 10 to $15 more than the trainers from the unscented room. When asked why, they didn't know why. It's just how they felt. It's just how they felt. That's, that is, I, I think that's a great ending to this conversation. It's all about how we feel. <laughs> it sounds so, you know, oblivious or whatever, but it's true. We, we feel something, we have a reaction. You don't have to explain it. That's just, you've made up your mind. 
And so I think that's why this is so important for people to be paying attention to. It's, it's as simple as that. Simon, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for, uh, you know, you're in Singapore and I'm in California right now. So thank you for staying up later <laughs> to do this conversation. Thank you. It's been, been a pleasure. My sort of, I always like to think of takeaway for listeners is to actually take the, to be aware of the perspective, to take a step back and go, right, what are our customers actually experiencing? And how could we apply a little bit more detail within the customer journey to create some form of consistency that appeals to us, that is reflective of the brand one way or another, and that they can quite easily do without having to spend a fortune. Uh, if anyone wanted to reach out to you, how would be the best way for them to find you? Connect with me on LinkedIn, Simon Fourfield at Equal Strategy. Alternatively, they can drop me an email at simon.forfield at equalstrategy.com, or they can visit our website, www.equalstrategy.com. Wonderful. Well, thank you again. Thank you. Tune in next week for the conclusion to our conversation. And don't forget to subscribe on all the major podcast channels. Share it with friends, follow, and rate. Spread the word because, well, more people should know about this stuff. I know you know that now. For any other inquiries, you can find me at Dreamer Productions. That's D-R-E-A-M-R productions.com. Soundandmarketing.com, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. You can also email me at Gina, J-E-A-N-N-A, at dreamerproductions.com. All links will be provided in the show notes. Let's make this world of sound more intriguing, more unique, and more and more on brand.